Apples play a huge role in Appalachian foodways. In fact, they play such a huge role that many people just refer to apples as fruit. Uh, in other words, kind of like thinking, what other fruit could there be? There's apples. That was like a mainstay of people's diets in days gone by. Probably the main reason that was so is because most of the Appalachian region, especially the region, the southern part where I'm at, are known for growing apples. It's just the, the region, the temperate, the climate, all that is just perfect condition to grow apples. Western North Carolina, where I'm at, is really a huge apple producer, and apples grow very well here. So that was one of the reasons, just because of the that was an easy thing for people to grow in days gone by when they had to have uh, had to worry about putting up for the winter. Well, apples was fit perfectly along with all the garden stuff they grew. Apples, they would dry them. A lot of people you hear talk about, they maybe spread out a sheet, maybe a piece of tin, maybe a screen, and they uh, would dry the apples in the sunshine, take them in at night, put them back out in the day. Also, if you were lucky enough to have an attic, a lot of people use that attic space to dry apples. So that was one method of preserving apples. They would dry them. Then, of course, they could make applesauce. They could make um, apple jelly, apple jams, apple preserves. Also, uh, apple brandies, that kind of thing. They can make apple cider out of it. So the apple was just such a versatile piece of food for people in days gone by when they had to look to the future of what they were going to be eating during the winter months. But as with many of those things, um, those types of things that fit so well for, for uh, the need of actual hunger, to feed that hunger in days gone by, today we still love them because people just continue to make those same recipes and to grow those, to, to have that love for apples, even though in today's world, of course, we're not um, as uh, hamstrung or as hindered by what we need to put up for the winter. We can go to the grocery store and we have modern conveniences. We have lots of food from choose to choose from. You can go right now even in the little small town that I live in and pretty much any fruit you can think of you can find in one of the local grocery stores. So apples by no means is the main uh, fruit today, but there is still that holdover of love of apples in Appalachia just from days gone by when they really needed to depend on it. So as I mentioned, people would even just go so far as to call apples fruit. They just refer to it as fruit. I grew up in a household like that. Granny and Pap, that's what they would call. They called applesauce or whatever fruit. Um, I can remember lots of times Granny, after I was married, would call me during the day when her and Pap was both, you know, Pap was no longer working and they were at home. And she'd call me and she'd say, Tipper, why don't you come down and eat dinner with us? Your daddy's made a pan of fried taters. I've made biscuits and we're going to open a jar of fruit. So that's why she was really opening a jar of applesauce, but she called it fruit. That's one of the things that's documented in the Dictionary of Smoky Mountain English, and here's the entry for, for it. Uh, fruit is a noun. Apples preserved, stewed, or made into sauce. 1926, Wilts and Cullowee word list equals fruit equals apples. We have lots of fruit this year, but no peaches. So see, that was an example where in those days, that's not common today, people don't do that today, they would say apples or peaches. But in those days, fruit, apple was so common and it was so common to be called fruit that that's just, in their mind, they would, like he said, we have lots of fruit, but no peaches. So he was differentiating between the two. 1939, Hall Collection, White Oak, North Carolina. Will you have some of the fruit passing the applesauce. As they passed the applesauce, they said, will you have some of the fruit? 1973, a lot of times we'd have applesauce. We called it fruit. That's like Granny calling her applesauce fruit. 1973, Medford Long Hard Road, apples, back in the old days, contributed a big part to the family living. It was just spoke of as fruit. You didn't call it applesauce. Apples fit into every meal as well as to eat raw between meals and at night as we sat around the fire. They were dried, smoked, treated with sulfur or bleached. They were made into apple butter, jelly, cider, as well as pies of all kinds, including the family or deep dish pie and fried pies made from dried apples. There were can they were canned, baked, as well as stewed. Most tempting to me was to bite into one raw. 1984, Dykeman and Stokely at home, called simply fruit by the early settlers, apples such as the favorite limber twigs and millums gave both variety and nutrition to the pioneer diet. So that was from the Dictionary of, of Smoky Mountain English. And that's exactly the fruit is how I grew up um, Hearing that, hearing applesauce referred to, especially by Granny and Pat. 
And I wish that I could say that I always say fruit today, but I don't. I mostly say apples or applesauce. That's, that's one of the words that'll be gone soon. I need to try to, to, at least in my household, need to try to switch my way of thinking back to granny's and start using fruit for applesauce, but I, I'll be honest with you, I don't. Uh, another way that, that's kind of mentioned in the dictionary there, that of course they eat them raw too, just like we would today. I ate an apple pretty much every day. I ate an apple for my breakfast well, along with some other stuff, but I ate an apple. But they would, um, I know Ethelene Dyer Jones, she's one of my great readers on Blind Pig and the Acorn. She's told me that her family over in Showestoe, Georgia, that they would take uh, June apples until the or once the fall crop arrived, there see the apples too. They can there's an early apple like a June apple that lots of people talk about, and that would add, those apples actually come become ripe like in June, hence June apple, or in July, and so that was kind of the the fresh when you got through the hard winter. That was one of the first fresh fruits that you got to taste. So people really you'll hear fond memories of people talking about June apples. They really look forward to that. Um, it's just an early variety where most of the apples come come to harvest in the fall. So anyway, Ethelene told me one time that um, for those fall apples, of course, they would make applesauce. They would eat them stewed and fried and, you know, baked in different ways, but they would also wrap them um, in paper and store them in a barrel. And that way by Christmas, on Christmas, they'd have fresh apples. So that was like a novelty or, or a, a treat, a special treat for her family to get to do that. So people certainly ate them raw too in those days. Along with eating apples raw, you know, out of hand, uh, with the fried pies, dry, reconstituting the dried ones, frying apples, stewing apples, all that, probably one of the most common ways is apple pie. Everybody thinks about that, even all across America, of course, not just in Appalachia. But um, I have an apple pie recipe that I really like. It's really the fruit recipe that I use uh, for a lot of different fruits. Miss Cindy taught it to me. It's really simple, but it's a double crust. So someday maybe I'll show you that. But today I want to show you how to make, this is a different apple pie. And it's, I just call it Aunt Mary Jo's apple pie because that's where I first learned about it. I was actually a kid when I first ate it. Um, my aunt, it was, she was my great aunt, Mary Jo. And every summer she would have a reunion at her house. And we, would, we didn't always get to go to it because she lived about two hours away. But when we did, of course there was like most family reunions, there was lots of good food there. And somewhere along the way, she started making, maybe she made it before I could remember, but then when I was big enough to remember, she would always have this pie and we'd look forward to it. Well, of course, you know, Granny got the recipe and then Granny started making it, but we still called it Aunt Mary Jo's apple pie. So it's, it's kind of a different take on the apple pie and it may be one that's really familiar in your, in your area and you may be like, oh, I know all about that. But for us, it was like kind of a novelty, a new way of making apple pie instead of with the double crust and all that. So we've been making it, Granny's been making it now for, I guess, Gosh, I don't know, because I've probably been making it for a good 15 or 20 years since I've been married. So today I'm going to show you how to make Aunt Mary Jo's apple pie. First thing that you'll need is a pie shell, an unbaked pie shell. Now you can buy them, you know, the little ready-made ones. You can buy the ones that you, that you roll out and then put in your pie shell, or you can make your own. I've made my own today. Um, again, you've probably already figured this out if you've watched some of my videos. I don't, I'm not good about worrying about how pretty it looks. I just worry about how it tastes. So mine's not the prettiest crust ever, but it does taste good and we like it a lot. But there's all kinds of crust recipes and um, probably the best crust I've ever made or ever tasted was at John C. Campbell Folk School in the cooking class, Nanette Davidson. And it takes a lot of time though. It's really a, a work of art when she does it. Mine's not a work of art, but it's plenty good enough for us. So I really like it. So first you need, that's what you need. Uh, and then you need two cups of apples, of chopped apples, and you're going to cook them on top of the stove. You put two tablespoons of water into the apples and you let them cook for about five minutes. Now while they're cooking, you really need to watch them in case they scorch. You need to make sure that they don't scorch because that's not very much water. So I've got mine already pre-cooked and then you're going to put them just in your uh, unbaked pie shell and kind of even them out and spread them around. Then you're gonna mix up the rest of the ingredients and pour it over the apples. That's how simple it is. So I've got a half of a stick of butter that I've melded, I've got right here. I've got three cups of uh, sugar, so I'm gonna put that in. I've got a tablespoon of flour, and it really doesn't matter if you use self-rising or all-purpose. 
both will work. I think that's all purpose though, or plain flour as Granny would say. Then I've got a teaspoon of cinnamon and a half a teaspoon of salt. And I've got one beaten egg. And you just kind of stir it all up together. It's not real, it's not real thick, but then again, it's not real liquidy either, but it doesn't matter. It's okay. I guess I could try to show it to you. So it's, I guess it's about like pancake batter or something like that. Anyway, once you've got it mixed up good, I gotta spread my apples out a little better than I did. And then you put it over the apples. Kind of spread it around to the edges over top. And that's it. And then you're going to put it in the oven uh, at 350 degrees and you're going to bake it 30 to 35 minutes depending on your oven of course. Uh, what you want to see is of course the crust. You can tell when it's done when it's a golden brown but you kind of want the top of the apples to be a golden uh, uh, brown too. You want it to be browned on top and that's how you'll know that it's done. So I just got the pie out of the oven. You can see the golden color it gets on top. and You can see that we've already been enjoying it. Here's a piece that I cut so that you could see the filling. So it's kind of like an apple tart. It's an apple pie, but it reminds me of a tart because it just has that crust and then the filling is really thin. And then you can see the apples and the cinnamon and the sugar and stuff in the filling because it's not a very large filling, so you can see it. It's a really good pie though. And if you ever want to try it, I hope you do. I hope you'll like it. I've also found that it works really good with blueberries. So that if you just replace the, do the recipe exactly the same, but use blueberries, it makes a really good pie. So over the years, the pie has become one of our favorite pies because it tastes so good, because it's easy to make, but then we have the added benefit is that we have those memories tied to Aunt Mary Jo, that that's where the pie come from. That's who taught us to make it. So, it, so it's, there's a nostalgia part of it uh, that gives you a good feeling on the inside and then the pie tastes good. It's also extremely easy to make, as you've seen. So it's easy to whip up when you just want a simple dessert or if you want one to take with you to a potluck or you gotta take one to a friend or take one to a church fund. Function. It's just really a quick, easy pie. So that's an added plus. So it's really become one of our favorite go-to pies over the years. So my Mamma Marie was Mary Jo's sister. And it was a large family, and as often happens in large families, there was a big age difference between those oldest children, which was Mamma Marie, and those youngest children, which was Mary Jo. So when Mary Jo was still living at home, they lived here in this holler, mountain holler, where I'd live. So a lot of the times when I'm walking around or I'm up the creek or out in the woods, I think about her. I think about the ones that were still small enough to be at home and that this was their home too, you know, just like it's been my home my whole life. Mamma Marie was already married and she lived here too, but then they moved to different places. But anyway, so those are the, she's one of the people, Mary Jo is, that I think about when I, when I think of people walking the same trails that I do, the same place the same woods, uh, driving the same road. She may have been driving it in a horse and a buggy, you know, but I'm driving it in a car. Anyway, all those wonderful things. So my mamma Marie died when I was in fifth grade. She was 67 years old. She died of a heart attack. And I did spend a lot of time with her because she was my babysitter, so she babysit me for granny. But of course, in fifth grade, what was I really asking her? You know, it wasn't like we had deep conversations about life or how you cooked this or how you made this or what was it like when you were growing up. So I have good, I have memories of her, but I just wish I knew so much more. Of course, Pap told me story after story after story. He could tell me about it. It was his mother, so he could tell me all kinds of stuff. But several years ago, I was thinking about Mama Marie, and then I thought of Mary Jo, and I thought, well, she's got stories that I've never heard. You know, Mama was her sister, so she could tell me stuff. So I called her one day on the phone, and after I asked her how she was, um, 
She said she was fine and all that, and we talked about that kind of stuff. I said, well, I really was calling because I wanted to see what you could tell me a story about Mama Marie. And she said, well, I, I rightly don't know what you want me to tell you. And I said, well, anything. Tell me anything that comes into your mind. You know, I just want to hear it. I'm just interested in hearing anything about her. So she thought for a few minutes, and she said, well, I remember one time when I was a little girl. Well, like I said, there was that age difference. Mama Marie was already married. And Mary Jo said, so your uh, Mama and Wade, they were living on the Hawshaw farm. They were sharecroppers there, and I would went to spend the night with them. And she said, and I really can't remember if your dad, Jerry, Pap, if he was alive, uh, if he'd been born yet, or if it was before he was born. See, Mary Jo and Pap was more of the same generation because of that age difference in uh, Mama, even though Mary Jo was Pap's aunt, he was she was really closer to his age. Anyway, she said, I can't really remember if he was a baby, if he had been born or not. But she said, me and Frances, that was another sister, she said, me and Frances went to spend the night with Marie and Wade. And she said, and Wade had went off somewhere. He was a fox hunter, and I believe he went fox hunting. He liked to go fox hunting. And she said, and this somebody come pounding on the door and scared us, and Marie went and answered the door, and it was a man, and he was really drunk, and he was wanting Wade. And, and she kept telling him, Wade's not here. You're not coming in. You're not going to come in this house. And she said, me and Frances were scared to death. She said, we was hugging each other, and we was starting to cry. We didn't know what was going to happen. And she said, uh, Marie just stood her ground. And finally, she, she run the man off and he left. She said, or so we thought. She said, and then uh, about 15 or 20 minutes later, we heard someone in the back room and he was trying to crawl in the window. He was trying to come in the window. And she said, and Marie just went in there and she told him he was going to leave. And she meant it right now. He wasn't going to come in that house no matter what. And the man said he wanted cigarettes, what it was. He was really drunk, it was what the problem was, but he wanted a cigarette. And Marie said, I told him, said, we don't have no cigarettes here. You're going to have to come back when Wade's here. Now, I mean it. You're going to turn around, and you're going to leave this place, and you're going to leave right now. And so uh, Mary Jo said, so he did. And they watched him go out of sight that time till he left. But she said, so that's what I thought of uh, Marie. She was always so tough. She could handle anything. She was the best big sister. She always took care of us. And like that, me and Frances were terrified, but Marie handled it just like she always handled everything. She just took care of it. And then she shared one other memory with me, which is really sweet. And it made me think of my girls at the time were a lot younger. Of course, now they're grown, but it really reminded me of them. So she said one time her and, again, Frances and uh, Mary Jo were walking with Mama Marie. This was before um, Marie was married. So she was probably about, uh, I don't know, 17, 16 years old. And then they were little girls. You know, they were a lot younger. And she said we were walking uh, to church at Bethel here in this area where I live, there's a church, Bethel Baptist. She said we were walking up there to church and she said, and Frances got to complaining and saying that she couldn't walk no more and she was too tired and somebody needed to carry her. And she said, Marie kept saying, no, you're just gonna have to walk. You're too big and I can't carry you. Now you're just gonna have to walk. And she said, we walked on a little further and she said, Frances said, I really need to tell you something. And, and Marie said, okay, well tell me. And she said, no, it's it's really private and I don't want anyone else to hear it. So you're gonna have to bend down, let me hear it, whisper it in your ear. I need to whisper it. It's something nobody else can't hear. She said, Marie said, well, okay. And she leaned down and, and Frances, for Frances to whisper in her ear, but instead Frances grabbed her around the neck and then wouldn't let go and said, you're gonna have to carry me. And she said Marie laughed, but she did carry Frances. So Frances had pulled the pulled the trick on her and got her to carry her. Anyway, and she said, and I don't even know why I told you those two memories. And um, that's not nothing probably you wanted to hear. That's just so silly what I thought of. I said, it's not silly at all. You just shared two memories of my Mama Marie with me that I've never heard before and really give me an insight into who she was. She was tough. She run that man off and didn't let him in the house. And then she was... Uh, it had a good sense of humor or she would have got mad when Frances pulled the trick on her and she was loving because she carried Frances the rest of the way to the church. So I said, you just told me, you know, gosh, you give me a gift, Aunt Mary Jo. Thank you so much. Anyway, so I love family stories, as you can probably tell. I hope that you'll take the time to ask the elders in your family, even the little trivial stories like that. Those two just, I'm so glad that I asked her. You know, I should have asked her more. That's my only regret is that I should have kept calling her every week and said, tell me this, tell me that, tell me this. But I didn't because, of course, our lives are so busy and her life was busy too. So I couldn't do that to her on a regular basis. Anyway, but I hope you enjoyed hearing about Mary Jo and learning how to make her pie. 
I hope you'll give it a try, but mostly I just hope you'll drop back by often as I celebrate Appalachia.